Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co host. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. All right, friends, before we get started, I want to shout out a very special Etsy store, Meraki Made Products. This is a store put together by a friend of mine, local to Minnesota. Um, He makes some cool gaming supplies. One of them is a measuring snake. The measuring snake uses magnetic one-inch increments that you can snap together, plus an end piece that is for specific models. So, for example, you can use a 32 millimeter end cap Um, Plus the base of the model equals two inches and then you can measure front to back. It's just like a magnetic bendy ruler and it's super cool and I highly recommend checking it out. There will be a link in the show notes. All right, Justin. How how do you want to start this? You, You know, you've been on our podcast discord for quite a while. You know, fan of the podcast. I think back in the day, we oh, yeah. pinged you and asked if you wanted to come on right as you started organizing around your local scene. But yes. it, you denied us at the time. But now we've got the No Coast Open coming up in August. Yeah, man. Um, so when you guys, when you reached out to me before, I had nothing going on. I was kind of feeling out like how to do it. But it was just me and my one friend playing every week, every Saturday, and just playing a game of Kill Team. I'm like, how do I get more opponents? So I had to figure that out, figure out how to find people to play Kill Team with. Yeah. A a common problem tale. for a lot of POs. Yeah. yeah how did you work through it? Man, um, so ultimately what I did was I stopped trying to find people locally and I drove two hours to play with, you know, play a little tournament two hours away over here and two hours away over here. Um, and I sort of just started meeting all of the like different communities within driving distance of myself and trying to, um, I mean, at the same time, I was also, you know, I'd do it, get on discords and I'm like, uh, anybody want to play kill team? And I would teach a guy over here and teach one guy. And so over the course of several months, I had, you know, a handful of players locally and I had met, you know, small communities all within a couple hours. And I would just go play events at. Are these mostly little tournaments or are these like play nights? You know, what was the vibe at all these different small areas? Yeah, I mean, um, all. Small tournaments, I'd go out for a three-round, eight-man, six-man tournament. I'd drive two hours and four hours sometimes, and people would be like, oh, he drove all the way out here for you know a little tournament in this game store that they don't even... I just would look on um, Best Coast Bearing for all the listings within a certain range and show up. And ultimately, what I was trying to do was, like, if I could make friends two hours over here and two hours in that direction, I kind of become the central hub for all of those communities. When I throw events, they'll drive to me. And so that was kind of, kind of the yeah. idea. Yeah. You're, like, grassroots you're rallying the clans. Yep. And you were playing Felgor and chaos cults and now on mandrakes throughout this time period. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I played most of it. I played a few of those events on chaos cults, but most of them were on man or on uh, Felgor. And now I've been on Mandrake since uh, I played my first real game with them at the Dallas Open. So I played I played seven games of them in one weekend and just like you know trial by fire with those guys. Have you been feeling like the Mandrakes are as powerful as you know parts of the internet have called them out to be? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're great. They have a lot of tricks, and I think you could... They're very powerful, but you can really misplay them. So they, you can find yourself, you know, just... They're pretty squishy, so they die. Uh, so trying to figure out where to be and how to play them has been a, a fun challenge. Any tips for players who are interested in playing Mandrake? I know that this is just generally a problem that a lot of elf teams have, which is eight wounds, four up saves. Sounds okay, but when you only have nine or eight operatives, mm-hmm. you really can't take that much fire. So you're really looking for as many asymmetric situations as possible. Which, you know, what kind of tools right. on the Mandrakes have you found uh, useful for that? 
I think there are two things that I've really picked up recently, and that is a the shade weaver doesn't necessarily need to be opening the portal super early. I think it's more important to put down the weave darkness token to give yourself some space to move around and uh, stay safe. And the other thing is, I think that they're incredibly fast with all the like out of a out of activation dashes, but I think that can be a trap. Sometimes you can move yourself right up into charge range and the shooting range of your opponent when you don't really want to be. So kind of trapping yourself into using the the movement um, where you could you can kind of use it to to hang back or move out of um, out of danger instead of moving forward. So yeah, and then like on the flip side, you could use it to extend your charge range. So like dash during the opponent's turn on a model that hasn't activated yet and then charge from there and really just get like a bananas long range charge. Have you, have you like dabbled with using that at all? Oh, 100%. Yeah, man. I went, um, one of my games with the Dallas open, I used my recon dash to push my guy right up, um, to the edge of, uh, an Octarius building. I had the four inch dash equipment. So I gave him, it was my leader. So I give him the four inch dash out of activation. He can dash between two Octarius buildings. Then you spend the CP to charge through the building. And I was in my opponent's drop zone fighting his heavy gunner uh, on turning point one. So it was pretty sweet. I love that. Yeah, eight inches, so like almost 16 inches. So basically covering almost the entirety of the board. So if he moved anyone up early, if you you can just slingshot yeah. and engage model. I guess for turn two, this is definitely one of the things that a lot of people have talked about for Mandrakes is that on turn two, it's very hard to deny them the first charge advantage. Right. Yes. Yep. Uh, so yeah. So he had, he had moved his heavy gunner up and got him just barely just, just up to get, uh, you know, try to get a shot off or something. I don't remember where he was playing. He placed him behind a barricade, but I was able to basically slingshot all the way across the field kill his heavy gunner and then um basically deny all the activations he wanted to make uh in the orders he wanted to make them with the leader so it's pretty sweet ah uh, yes the harrowing whispers of the mandrake night fiend forcing your opponent to have to roll dice before you can even activate his models exactly and you know man i've also never rolled so many five ups when i needed them except for that ubli x the ubli x goes off every single time for some reason <laughs> yeah he's shockingly tanky between the ubli x and um delaying people's activations and um you could potentially heal him as well oh yeah yeah the mandrakes definitely have lots and lots of powerful plays and one of the big things that they get to do compared to a lot of other teams is they can have that long bomb charge but if you charge them first they can take shadow's bite and start combat and go first which means that generally they're staging a fair number of anti-melee threats whereas against shooting you know the four invuln is quite good and the four invuln with a retain is also pretty annoying but they still only have eight wounds so have you found that frailty in the uh, shooting to be a detriment i know at dallas maybe you haven't done quite as well as you would have liked but obviously from one long tournament to the next you generally learn quite a bit so what kind of lessons did you take from your games in Dallas? Yeah, uh, I learned two things. One, you're right. The shooting, like, it's hard to take. You can't take too many shots. So if you leave yourself open, uh, you could just expect to lose that guy. So sometimes that, you know, that comes into play. But um, I also played, there were times when I was, like, trying to play 2 cage. I'm like, okay, I'm going to chip, chip these Marines down with, with some shooting before I charge. and Ultimately, in most of the, like the twelve wound model, I'm just going to kill them in two crits, and I'm going to get a lot of crits with my lethal five up. So, um, getting a little bit aggressive with with my melee when I should have been a little—I mean, I should have been more aggressive when I was playing a little too kg in Dallas. So, since then, I've gotten—I've kind of felt that out a little bit. But yeah, yeah, kind of walk us through that that flip point because I know that. When it comes to games of kill team, a lot of teams, I know Space Marines specifically, have this moment where the operative count is low enough and now your 3 APL is strong enough where you can f change gears. And instead of playing like a coward and keeping all of your Marines alive, you can go aggro, pull out all the stops and just start blowing CP and blowing people up. 
Where does the pivot point for you in your games? Because obviously Mandrakes, because they can both shoot and do melee reasonably well, it's kind of hard to know mm-hmm. when to do one or the other. Yeah, you know, I still, like, with certain teams, especially ones I haven't played a lot into, uh, I struggle to find that point sometimes, but I think I've kind of figured out that there's a trick where, like, I would kind of push forward, and then I would basically create space for them to charge me, but currently I'm I'm more like, a, I'm moving up a little bit on turning point one, and I'm trying to get them to move uh, on a, up closer to me. So basically I want to be the aggressor in charges. So anytime I can, I can kind of bait them into moving forward, does two things. It lets me get the charges and get the, you know, first combats off. And then also if I can pull them out of their deployment zone, I might be start teleporting in behind them, uh, and trying to take in board control that way. So. Yep. Being able to line up the smoke grenade to open up a back, backline teleport towards the end of one so if your opponent moves up and they're not paying attention to it then suddenly they have to deal with you know getting pincered in by different mandrakes can be very annoying right yeah for sure yeah um and you had kind of sort of tickled on the edge of this question but like as a as a sweeping sort of general take do you consider them to be more of a shooty team or more of a fighty team or is it matchup dependent Ooh, i and I might be wrong here, but I think they're more of a fighty team. Like I, I do like the shooting, uh, but I think I typically, I mean, as, as I said, I played chaos cults in Felgor. Like I like melee teams. So I think I just lean into the, the melee portion of the team more. I mean, the melee is good. If you're in shadow, you know, your basic mook warriors, they are basically just power swords in the open without shadow. Not quite as good, but as you know, as most Mandrake players would tell you, they try to stay in shadow as much as possible. Did you ever run into Correct. situations where you weren't able to stay in shadow? And how did you interact with the problem in those situations? And how did you like try to force your opponent to get into shadow with you? Yeah, I've I find myself accidentally putting myself out of position for that stuff sometimes. And ultimately, uh, it's just it's just bad. Five up saves are terrible. <laughs> like. Uh, with a wound guy, so um, I haven't luckily run into a lot of a lot of opponents who have sort of played the game where they they make sure that I can't charge them and stay in shadow. Like a lot of people, I mean, they're trying to stay safe too for the most part. But I think if you were to do that, uh, you would really ruin a Mandrake player's day if you could just stay just far enough away from heavy to keep them from charging you in shadow. So have you, yeah, I mean, I, this is actually a big, big topic, I think, because of the influence of all the map packs kind of in and about the world. A lot of them have heavy on a lot of objectives. Did you, have you found that that has helped your Mandrake play? Or have you seen a lot of the regions, you know, near Tulsa, where you're playing, are using map packs? Or are you guys doing kind of freeform maps like we do in New York? Mm-hmm. Yeah, most people are using the Turning Point Tactics version 2 maps still, and those are great for Mandrakes. They're super nice uh, with all the um, heavy right on right up the middle. You kind of use those dashes and stuff to your advantage, but we happened to get a sponsor at our last tournament, and they sent us out a bunch of um, terrain, and so we're kind of working on, like, we built a bunch of reasonably balanced maps, but... I tried to make it so like, you know, maybe this map over here uh, is better for a melee team, but this one still has some pretty good shooting lanes. And like, instead of trying to build the maps around like, oh, we don't want Pathfinders to kill you on the first turn or kind of some variation in each map. So, Okay. Uh, talk, us, talk to us about that uh, sponsored terrain. I'm sure that because they're your sponsor, you want to talk them up a little bit. How does it compare to Octarius terrain or maybe something like the new Bandua WTC terrain? Yeah, dude, this stuff is vis- visually super awesome. Uh, it's Tinker Turf. I don't know if you've heard of those guys. Um, they did a big Kickstarter a while back, but it's all... Um, like I have seen these. Actually. I played on these. Flat pack. I played on these in yeah. 2018 when I first started getting back into Warhammer stuff, but I haven't used it since then. Okay. Yeah. So some of the stuff, 
I like it a lot. There's definitely a lot of containers. And so especially like Mandrakes really love a like a super thin Octarius wall to charge through uh, where the containers kind of create some barrier for that. But um, so this is pros and cons, but it's been great. It sent us a bunch of it. Like we use it, uh, I store it at the store and all of my guys can just go in and play with it whenever they want. So, um, but it yeah, would be, I mean, there are be... no L-shaped buildings. Yeah. Is this going to be the terrain that you're going to be using at the no coast open in part? Um, at least in part. Yeah, for sure. We've got so much of it and, uh, we don't have like my community here. My community here is so new. Um, not a lot of people have full terrain sets. So, you know, uh, to make up as many boards as I may need, depending on how signups go, uh, I'll probably dip into some other stuff, but at least like a big sig- a portion of it will be uh, the Tinker Turf stuff at the No Coast Open. Yeah. For anyone just listening in on the podcast who's never heard of Tinker Turf, they are basically a cardboard cutout terrain that basically comes together and is fully, fully pre-painted. And I think when I used it back in 2018, it was just a little bit past kill team size models. Like, but it's roughly around sector munitorum crates. And I, looking at the pictures, it kind of looks like maybe it's like a Nakamund ish platform. Is that does that sound about right, Justin? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's pretty much uh, dead on. So yeah, it, like the it can be are nice. Kind of... I remember the quality of the pieces yes. being fairly good when I played with them. So looking forward to seeing what those pictures look like in August. Yeah, for sure. I'm hoping to get um, a few of the sets that I didn't get before uh, before the tournament and work out some, spend a lot more time building some balanced maps with the stuff. Uh, we've got a local guy who is he's just like a genius with the map. So I'll, I'll usually just hand him stuff and be like, hey, help me figure this out. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's cool. I think uh, if you were able to mix in some of some actual GW stuff like Sector Munitorum or the Vertigus terrain walls, I think it would actually blend together pretty nicely. And that way you would get a mix of both official and unofficial stuff, because it looks like it's more on the light side, at least from their Kill Team bundle compared to some of their other stuff. Yeah, definitely. Then that Kill Team bundle is uh, something he's doing new, I suppose, because it wasn't available before. He sent me just like a bunch of crate kits and a bunch of... um, like the scatter terrain and the containers. So we just have a huge variety. I mix so much um, different boards with it. But I did think that like some L-shaped buildings would be super awesome. Yeah, it's it's always cool to see how different regions find different sponsors and build their build the communities up over time, because not everyone can just play on GW terrain, because let's be honest, it is a little expensive. Yes, yep. Yeah, especially from a TO perspective where you're getting a bunch of terrain. That's right. Yeah, I was like, how do I fill 10 boards or more at a time or now, you know, potentially you know, 15 or 18 boards? It's going to be, it's not like, gotta, I got to get some help somehow. Yeah, I know we have a couple of listeners in like the Midwest or not the Midwest, but basically not not on just the coast. So you want to tell us a little bit more about the uh, No Coast Open, who's organizing with you, where it is, kind of talk it up a little bit before yeah. we switch back over to, you know, maybe more competitive stuff, talking about the current meta menace like Felgor or Nemesis Claw. Yeah, shout out the date again, too. Yeah, I mean, this uh, here at No Coast Open, um, it's a two day. We're going to do I'm going to go for six rounds. Um, it's happening on August 17th and 18th, and it's a suburb of Tulsa. Um we got a really great venue. It's like an esports arena slash restaurant slash bar. And they were really trying to figure out how to get into get the tabletop community in there. And so we held our last tournament there. And it's it's like it's so great having uh, food and beverages and stuff right there. We don't have to travel, take a lunch break and go somewhere else. Um, so we're going to do two days and we got a golden ticket for it. And we got a whole bunch of sponsors. So we we'll have a bunch of prizes. Last last tournament I ran, I had a bunch of sponsors come on, and I gave at least half of my uh, players something when, before they left, uh, just based on all the prize support we had. So I'm hoping to do something similar here. Yeah, that's amazing. Nice. Yeah, I guess the the middle of the country's got a lot of esports arenas, huh? Because the Dallas Open was also run we, at an esports arena. 
It was, yeah. So we have these guys are. It's like a like a lounge esports. You can go in there and rent PCs, and they host a lot of esports tournaments. But the good news of that is they have a streaming setup. They have cameras that can point straight out of the rafters onto the table. Um, so I'm working with their production guys to try to get a nice scan and potentially stream the event also. Yeah, that'd be very cool. Um, yeah, if you get a link, shoot it our way, and we can share it too. Okay, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's only so many golden ticket events in the U.S. So for anyone, you know, in the Oklahoma area, make sure to take a look because it does sound like it'll be a fun event. Yep. Unfortunately, um, the dates match up at the same weekend as the Gateway Open in St. Louis. So a lot of the people who would probably are kind of equidistant between here and there are all already committed to the Gateway Open. So uh, potentially an easy golden ticket for somebody. We got a lot of people in Texas, so you know Texas. Maybe now's the time to make a trip out to Oklahoma and uh, steal this golden ticket from Justin's uh, Justin's yeah. player grace. Yeah, I'd love it. Uh, unfortunately, you also will be competing for that golden ticket with two Garretts, so that's the. Uh, <laughs> it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, the infamous Garrett family running amok through the entire U- continental United States <laughs> looking for their last pair of golden tickets. Yeah, I was going to say, do they already have their golden tickets? Yes, Liam right now. He won uh, one at the UTC finals at the beginning of the year. And then Leander and Mark are both still still on the search. And for anyone who has no idea who we're talking about, there's a family from the East Coast, the Garrett family. They went to the World Championships last year, all three of them. So this year, they're hoping to make a family repeat, trying to grab a bunch of tickets and qualifiers and do better than their placement last year. Yeah, for sure. I met mark and liam last year in kansas city and uh mark and leander were both in dallas uh leander was in second place he just just missed it just and missed so it. i think they're still they're still in the hunt yes there there are still plenty of tickets to go around but the garrett's are definitely looking to score at least two of them i think yeah last year mark won kansas city i think he got second place with phobos and because kansas city had two tickets to give out mark got the other one right yep yeah i mean you know as far as golden ticket events coming up in the u.s coming up in the first weekend of july we have the goon hammer open up in baltimore i'll be hosting that one we'll be using the bandua terrain and that should be fun as well with a 300 hundred dollar cash prize not quite as cool as everybody getting a single prize like the no coast open but 300 bucks is 300 bucks and a golden ticket have do you have any players in your region justin that have been going out with you to these tournaments or has it really been you pushing pushing the scene yeah so the guy i started playing with uh his name is eddie and he drives like he's like yeah let's go we'll go to any tournament that i invite him to whenever he's free and so he's been out with me and he's you know he's really good so he'll go out and then he'll beat everybody in the local scene and then he'll be like hey yeah, now you got to come back to our tournaments to get your revenge so uh it's been great but he's super nice and uh We've started getting a few of the newer other people to travel too. So we've got people coming and going in every direction, seems like. Yeah, definitely a big draw for the kill team scene is kind of just meeting a bunch of other people who are really interested in the same things that we are, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, my first tournament was the Kansas City Open last year, and that experience was pretty much what drove me to try to build the scene here so i could keep having that experience it was awesome what about your scene do you feel is unique compared to some of the other scenes that you've heard because for anyone who doesn't know justin you've been on our discord for a long time you know kind of chatting up talking about kill team here and there so you've probably heard a bunch of tos in the past do you feel like the oklahoma scene has anything special that you want to be able to share out to the rest of the world Man, I just well, I think of course I think it's special. It's like I I feel like I built it by teaching one person at a time <laughs> how to play this game. So um no, I mean it's been pretty great there. Everybody is you know, getting as as someone as people get more comfortable playing the game, you notice they're teaching their friends and they're teaching like people ask for a teaching game, people are just jumping on and offering uh to teach. So where at first it was the only games I was getting in were teaching games. Now the rest of the community is doing all the teaching for me. So I get to, you know, play in tournaments and get my games in every week. Yeah. I think one of the really rewarding things about being a TO or just deciding to take matters into your own hands sometimes is realizing that 
you know, at the beginning, you're not really playing or learning all that much, but eventually you meet other people who are just as into it as you are and you get to you get to give back and kind of grow, grow the scene. And it's really important that we all kind of remember how hard it was to start playing these games because these are very difficult to get into games, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that first moment when you walk into a game shop and you're like, anybody want to play Kill Team with me? We all still kind of have those moments in the back of our heads. So don't lose that because it's important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I started trying to play Warhammer and I'm like, ah, I don't know. I was like the end of ninth edition and I got a combat patrol. And I was like, but I was looking into Kill Team and nobody was playing it. Um, and then I just happened upon a guy who was looking for someone to paint his model. And I was like, well, I'll paint your models for you if you show me how to play this game. And I never played a single full game of Warhammer 40K after that. So, uh, I was just like, okay, Kill Team is where it's at for me. Yeah, easier footprint and a nice community, too. I think, you know, I just got back from Atlantic City and I feel like the different communities all have very different vibes. And it definitely seems like 40K is a very it's a rough community to be a part of because a lot of the players have forgotten what it feels like to be a new player and they're just there to just crush people. Yeah, yep. You know, you know, Jason, he used to be there. He used to be a competitive 40K person. Yeah. Yep, I was like traveling for competitive 40k events for a while um, in like 8th and 9th edition. And uh, yeah, it's it's way more cutthroat. Um, and like I had my fair share of like, I was like, you know, you, you lose a couple rounds, you run into a new player and then you absolutely obliterate them. And it's like, oh man, this game, this game gets ugly. Not nearly yeah, as much kill, with Kill Team. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I was going to say with Kill Team, it seems like you have your first game of a tournament, you meet a new person and then you're checking back in with them every, after every round. Uh, it's like you're instantly friends. And I had that experience in Kansas city last year with my very first round was against, um, Ben from battle brothers tabletop, oh, yeah. which I didn't, you know, I didn't know who he was at the time. So, but now we talk every week. We're like, you know, suddenly I have all these friends all over the country from just, you know, making a couple hour drive to play kill team. And so it's been pretty awesome. Yeah. The magic of just hanging out with someone for two hours, playing the sweatiest possible game you can imagine rolling dice and, you know, for as much as four dice on threes, three, four bolters sound cool. Every once in a while you're like, well, I missed uh, all four shots. Great. And then you die. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or in Jason's case, you die and then you pull out your gun and you shoot one more time for the emperor. Yeah. One of the other teams that you were talking to us about in our pre-show notes, you mentioned Felgor. Felgor have been doing very well, I think, as of late. Uh, they took ACO with a clean 5-0 sweep, beating two different mirror matches. What do you, what do you think about the Felgor menace, as it were? Do you think that they're back? Do you think that people still need to learn how to play against them? And do you think that you would touch them with a, a balanced data slate? Um, I'm not sure how I would balance them, but I do think that they're still uh, kind of a problem. Um, I only didn't take them to Dallas because I was super excited to play the Mandrakes. And I was uh, I was a little concerned that, oh, well, I forgot. <laughs> um, I was a little concerned that, that I would run into a lot of, oh man. Higher tech? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Hyrotech. Yep. Yeah. I was like, why can't I think of this? And my one of my friends brought Hyrotech, and I was like, there's going to be so much Hyrotech here, and I cannot. I played the Felgor and the Hyrotech so many times in the last six months that I can't do it again. I was like, even if I, I couldn't, first I can't figure out how to win it. Second, I just don't think I could do it again and not lose my mind. So. Can you can you walk us through a little bit about what makes that matchup so hard for Felgors because I know that Felgor I think have been doing pretty well across the board especially because one of their better matchups would be Mandrakes I think because you are such a stat check team mm -hmm. sure you can't make all of your charges land but the fact that you get two bites at each charge against Mandrakes just means that through sheer weight of numbers and you know 15 ish goat lives you can generally wear down the nine Mandrakes pretty efficiently what about right higher tech and other teams that you might be worried about um 
feel like a bad matchup for Felgor. Haritek, I know, have been called out a couple times. Shane, the winner of ACO, called them out. And surprisingly, no one brought them to ACO. What about that matchup makes it really spooky for you? Um, I think that the fact that they're able to they're able to kind of hang back with their regular guys, make it hard to get the charge distances that you need. Um, they don't push up super hard, but then when they do shoot you, they just I just can't seem to survive a shooting attack from the cryptex or the apprentic and being able to get you know, you almost never know where that shot's going to come from because of the magnification conduit. It comes from one side of the board or the other. It's almost impossible to hide from. Yeah, the magnification conduit means that your shooting angles, when the Apprentic gets charged, now suddenly he can be the originating shot from your Cryptek, which can be devastating, especially because you might not kill them in one combat step, right? Right, exactly. And then obviously, when you actually do manage to kill an Immortal or a Deathmark or the Apprentic, they always get back up. And when they get back up, they can be at a high enough life total where you can't just instantly fight them and kill them again. Especially if you've taken an appreciable amount of damage the first time around. And often the lethal 5-up blades are doing a lot of heavy lifting in that matchup, I assume. Yes, yep. And so, you know, you're like, oh, cool. I spent two, two GOATS activations trying to kill this one guy. And guess what? Next turn, he's back again, and you got to deal with it again. So, uh, I don't know, man. It's just it's a matchup that I haven't figured out for sure. I mean, for what it's worth, I think you're in good company there. I think Shane has been on here, and he's described the Felgor matchup as one of the easier matchups. I think he's called out that higher tech circle are have very good matchups into the melee hordes just because they have to come to you and as they come to you you're gonna get some free crack grenades off with with ceaseless basically or not ceaseless but balanced so four dice on threes four right. five ap1 with a reroll that's a pretty good stat line against five up saves yes exactly and because you can meaningfully chip people down on the way in, when they finally hit you in melee, if they've taken any damage, there's a chance that your lethal five up melee is actually enough to parry out or every once in a while just kill a goat and then they frenzy on their activation and they just pass out. Yeah, Vortex lethal five is like shockingly high that you're going to get a crit. It's like it's it's pretty reliable um, and that's kind of a nightmare for goats. Um, and like if you if you both if you do one for one trades and then the Necrons stand back up, that's not very favorable at all. Precisely. Yep. So Felgor, that wasn't a matchup that you were willing to do for Dallas, but you did say that you've played Chaos Cults in the past. Was there a reason why you didn't take Chaos Cults to Dallas outside of Mandrix being like the most fun team for you right now? Because they're the new hotness and they are fun to play. Yeah, they're super fun to play. Um, I think I'm just kind of I kind of rode the Chaos Cults um, train as far as I could take it. It was just, it just gets stale after you play so many games with them. It's always, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you really only have, what, six um, or really five different data sheets, sort of. And so it's, it's, there's a lot of tricks. And then once they got nerfed to be in balance and they weren't, just broken uh it's not really fun to play anymore so uh. <laughs> that is true they were pretty dang good before all of the nerfs yeah i don't think that they're unplayable or anything but it just after i played so many games with them and they don't feel as strong and i played so i played a lot of uh, magic the gathering in the past and the same thing happens like if i play super competitive uh, decks and then go back to playing a casual deck that's just sort of decent like it just doesn't feel powerful i feel slow and kind of clunky and i don't like it so i felt the same way about chaos cult so the race car at full speed is much better than the family sedan precisely that's it yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, Chaos Cults, I think, have not been particularly well on week-to-week -week stats. There are weeks where they do very well, and then there are, I think, the majority of times that they show up, they're not doing all that well. So it's probably a mix of, they are a little bit more balanced, you've got to be way more precise, and that, you know, they're just hard to play, which definitely seems to be the case. Yeah, also interesting and worth noting, there's been plenty of times they just don't show up at all. Um, so they've just kind of, like, radically dropped in popularity. And 
for what it's worth, I think being an all melee, all melee team like Chaos Cult, it does come with like a little bit of atrophy of some of the other play skills. Obviously, you've been playing mostly melee teams and now you're switching over to Mandrakes. Which part of your game on the Mandrake shooting do you feel like maybe you've missed out on growing over time? Because I feel like this is a thing that a lot of players might struggle with if they find just shooting teams to be their preference or just melee teams to be their preference. Kind of like how I've had some issues because I play a lot of Pathfinders. I read a lot of matchups from a very pro shooting perspective. So have you noticed any spots of your game that you're like, ah, oh, now I see how shooting teams play. So the next time when you go back to maybe doing a little bit more melee stuff, you are going to be able to keep new things in mind, Justin. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been a, it's definitely been a learning curve trying to find like positioning for my shooting. Like when I'm planning to chip a guy down or I want to kill something and shooting. Um, I think I played a game against warp coven today and it's my first time ever playing against them. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to kill these guys in melee, but these guys I want to shoot and uh, finding myself putting myself in a position where I can potentially get non-reciprocal shooting or um, just like a favorable shooting position is not something that I've had a lot of practice in because I've been playing mostly melee teams. So I'm trying to figure out uh, all of that positioning stuff with shooting. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious if you have any kind of a absolute go-to strategy for like, who are your instigators? Who is your MVP? Um, and like, do you have a particular strategy for how you like to like instigate and like kick off the game? Um, I really, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think that I tried a bunch of different things that didn't work, which like I've tend to get a little too aggressive with the chooser of the flesh. And if I lose them early and I don't get any tokens, uh, that's, that's a, usually pretty terrible. Yeah, that's rough. Um, but I have found like, yeah, putting the putting the leader up the board early, which I, most teams I never do. I want to keep them safe, but getting the leader up so I can sort of control who gets to activate when they get to activate kind of feels like my jam, I think, with these guys. That is That does seem really strong and interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I haven't played as Mandrakes yet, but kind of my interpretation is I think I would put, like, one or two warriors on engage and kind of like dangle them as bait, but do it from like a really secure position. So they've got like the four of save the double retain. And then like you, you, you can throw a shot or two out, or even if you can't, and it kind of looks like you're, you're dangling and then people take the bait and they go for shooting attacks at it. You're just like soaking up hits that you probably don't take any damage from. And then you can like return hits. Um, and then the, the chooser of the flesh just needs to be like patient and be a counterpunch to when people hit your front line. Um, so then that's really going to pop off on like turn three and four with your extra APL. So it is kind of like a ramp up team like Hand of the Archon. Um, but I, yeah, I feel like uh, like a little bit of a, a slower pace there and like baiting people with a couple warriors is is where I would start. Uh, I agree. I did that. I did a little bit of that in my game um, earlier where I I definitely left a couple warriors even in deployment, um, they were relatively safe, but they could be targeted. And I was able to bait out some early shots. And then um, luckily my opponent at that, I mean, unluckily for me, but luckily for him, he, he reckoned, he's like, okay, that's definitely bait. But then he goes, uh, but sometimes bait is tasty. So <laughs> it'll take the shots. But yeah, I agree. If you, the counter punch with the chooser um, is definitely the trick. And then, it's definitely a team where you could lose a couple guys in the first two turning points and be down on points. And then all of a sudden you're all over the board and you're in the back lines. You can take those points back and crawl out of a hole with them for sure. Yeah. On the topic of building a good bait pile, you can have a warrior on engage. You can wreath him in bail fire and then he can just take, you know, one less damage on all attacks with a four up invuln and double retain. And you can really keep him in a spot where you can just nail people if they come out to respond to him. And he's really not in a ton of risk. Sure, he has eight wounds. But if you have two retain saves and a four up invuln and you take one less damage to a minimum of one, Bolter Fire is only going to do two, three damage 
probably not going to do much. Plasma can hit you, but it's probably not going to injure you because staying alive at four wounds is perfectly valid. And your opponent's really going to want to shoot those dudes because he knows he can't let you keep all nine operatives throughout the course of the game. And if you can get him into an angle where the chooser of flesh can ignore a piece of terrain, do the dash on turn two, and slingshot himself up at... 15 inch charge suddenly you can pass out one or two apl to someone else and now your opponent's in a a bit of a pickle yeah for sure being able to uh in those once you once you have those tokens from the chooser of the flesh being able to open up shade portal and drop weave darkness in key positions um they can really change uh like really mess up the plans of your opponent too if they're they're expecting to get a a key threat off the board and you've just suddenly dropped this a uh, never-ending smoke grenade right in the middle of the in the fight. So, yeah. how have you approached the game against teams with a little bit of ignores obscurity? So, Pathfinders, Casserkin, Crute come to mind. Do you have game plans specific to these teams yet, or have you played against them? I guess. Um, I've only pl- I played once against Crute, uh, but I haven't played against those other teams. And Crute, the Crute player that I played was, uh, well, I played twice, I guess. The first one was in Dallas, and it was against Alex, who won the golden ticket uh, the next, the following weekend with Crute. He was he was and just then, on here, yeah, two weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely, he was he was incredible. He's a great guy, and uh, he just walked through my man. Just like like he's been playing the team for a long time, and it was like maybe my second game with him. So, but. Not to take credit, take away his credit. Like he was, he positioned perfectly. He took away all of my ability to teleport. I never got a single teleport off after the first one because he was able to just walk his guys up and and prevent me from doing it. Um, but yeah, so my other, only other game against Crute uh, was with a relatively new Crute player, and so I haven't I haven't really come up to that challenge or had to figure out how to deal with obscuring yet or anti obscuring. So. Um, I'm actually kind of interested to see how that goes. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason why Mandrakes at the moment, I feel like are in a very good spot in the meta is that their equipment allows you to customize your team for the matchup, being able to give yourself super conceal and means that against the teams that do no obscurity, you can focus a little bit more on shadow glyphs to kind of set yourself up to charge the people who are trying to get your obscurity tricks down. It's good to hear that Alexander, you know, not good for you, but that his crew were able to find holes in the game plan and force you to not be able to teleport, which is a big problem for the team when you can't teleport, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, he, I mean, he read read me like a book. I put my recovery item down, I teleported onto it, and then he walked a guy right up to look into that spot, and I was like, okay, when he has enough bodies, so from the mid-board back, like, I could never find a spot that was safe, uh, that was able to be teleported in. And I think if you're playing against Mandrakes, if you have the bodies to just leave a guy back in the back lines um, to keep an eye on that stuff, uh, it can really mess up the game plan for sure. Yeah, I would assume that that is that's always been one of the cases that I thought Mandrix might have some issues. Obviously, on some of the turning point tactics maps, it's a little bit easier because most of the terrain in your drop zone is heavy and it's basically flat across your board, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I even played against Nemesis Claw at one point and my opponent just left uh, a gunner in the back. It's kind of peeking out so I could never get back there. And of course, I was thinking... Is six models he has to come forward so i dropped my recover item token all the way back there and uh i'm just gonna go get that with my courier and he never left it so uh you know that's an easy denial of so many points trying to be a little bit too cute if you're giving him the recon item in his territory huh yeah it was a it was a, a little cheeky but, you know you had to try it I had to try it at least once I mean, you're playing a tricky elf team. If you're not going to be tricky with an elf team, when are you going to be tricky, right? But it doesn't yeah, exactly. always work, of course. Have you found any of the tech ops to be particularly easy to score? I know that a lot of people have talked about Mandrake's tech ops being a little bit strong. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, I pretty much... Um, I mean, Mandrake's is a team that's probably the most team most map dependent team that i've ever played with but for sure almost always expect to score two points on death from darkness where you charge 
charge fight kill um starting and ending in shadow like all especially if you're playing turning point tactics maps or into the dark um i've never even tried to do the one where you have to you have to get within three of a guy and then leave him alive for the rest of the turn i just can't imagine how i would play that but um the other one is the control heavy trait in your opponent's territory i've scored that if i take it it's because i know i can score it the map you know allows me to just teleport up there and take it uh yeah. and it was totally broken on into the dark so luckily they took that away from a thumb into the dark because you just it's always two points for that that's true they did they just said that you cannot use it on in the dark if i remember correctly yeah yes I'd actually yep. definitely and... be curious to hear more in general about mandrakes and into the dark um and just like how it differs what are some like big changes that you have to do to adapt to it yeah because you were right they are one of the teams that has the biggest board style differences across all the teams because so much of your rules are based around within shadow so on open you know on turning point tactics maps you have lots of heavy on all the objectives which is great when you go to in the dark all of the objectives are like in the middle of the rooms and all of the heavy is like along the walls and then on beta decima it's just very hard to be in shadow in useful spots unless you're near the soup can so tell us a little bit about your experiences playing on in the dark into the dark um so there's a lot of luckily a lot of the in the middle of the room objectives depending on the size of the room you can still get within an inch of the pillar and still just have a toe on the objective like within two inches of the objective marker um but man if you just it's very map dependent like which layout you get but if my opponent comes into the rooms i'm just going in behind him <laughs> you know like you could just pop anywhere you want to on that on into the dark uh it just seems a little unfair this team on into the dark honestly you take your dash you take you take the uh one inch blast equipment on maybe half of your guys like i would put it on all my guys except for you suddenly if you know you're never going to get overwatch you can take it on all all five of your warriors if you want but normally i'll just go it on a couple guys and i use the creeping horror so i can just dash in between pillars on every single activation and suddenly i'm i can go anywhere on the map that i want to so yeah, so that means that on turn one, you can stage almost trivially all the way along the maps and you're using your FORP invuln. And are you taking Glomming Shroud when you're doing this? Because um, I, I would expect yeah, that sometimes. if you're hugging walls and you're using Creeping Horror, that means that as far as aggressive actions on turn one, you're going to be pretty chill. But you're going to be in awkward spots where you're not necessarily going to have cover just because you're creeping around walls, right? So Glomming Shroud seems to make sense to me on a strategic level so that on turn two you're prepped and everybody is in the rooms and the positions you want and you haven't taken too much damage yes exactly and so it also helps um all the dashes you know you can kind of use it to help reposition if you if you had to clump up in a spot or you needed to stay safe and you're not you don't want to be deploying right in the middle of the corridor but then you can dash into the corridor so you don't have to try to cut that corner and lose your movement to make it around. But yeah, Gloaming, Gloaming Shroud is super helpful in those cases, for sure. Does your region play with the asymmetric maps from Squad Games Mission Pack? Uh, or are you guys just, mostly so, just playing In the Dark by Games Workshop's book at the moment? Typically, most people are just playing Into the Dark, uh, the Games Workshop maps, but I have started trying out the the Squad Games uh, Dakota stuff. And just the other week, I played the one diagonal board, and that was uh, that was interesting. I wasn't sure. I was like, just it, at least it made Into the Dark seem like a different um, different ball game, kind of. I was like, I wasn't sure how to approach that map at all. Yeah, the it is the only map, I think, in semi rotation because it's not an official map pack that uses the corner deployments from the first season of In the Dark. And I don't think I played it at LVO. Jason, did you play on it? I did not either. I don't even know if Dakota bothered setting them up, but it is definitely a weird vibe. I remember in the first season of In the Dark, getting those corner deployments meant that you were just had very awkward game plans that you could just kind of avoid an opponent if you really wanted to. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't, I mean, it was fine, but it was definitely a challenge. And I don't think I would prefer to play uh, in that layout for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So but I think that's in the, the dark, only oh, in the ahead. dark, you're using glomming shroud, you're flying, flying around the map. You've got your teleports when you, once you've opened your opponent up, but you have less cover. So you're a little bit less durable, but for, for what it's worth, you can tie your opponent up a lot easier because the boards are way more open for melee. What about Beta Decima? Is your region playing a lot of Beta Decima? I might be the only person in a two-hour drive that has a set of Beta Decima, and I've played on it maybe five times. I think it's quite fun, but I don't think it's competitive, so we don't. We just almost never get it out. I see. So not a lot of access and no reason to really enforce it, because... We are, I think you're right. Most people, it's easy to cobble together some version of an open play experience just because the the rules are flexible enough where you can use almost any set of terrain. And then when it comes in the dark, I think everybody really enjoys in the dark. Those doors actually opening, I don't think will ever really truly get old for people who just want to play with their toys. Yeah, no joke. And my favorite thing to do when I was a kid was play with action figures. And it's still kind of a, my favorite thing to do as an adult. So, you know. Yeah. So having your action figures finally gets to really open a door. And then you when you go down to do that sight line, and you blow someone up. Still feels very cool. Yeah, super sweet. And now we have rules. So I can't just say, oh, my guy's not dead and your guy is dead. So that's pretty <laughs> sweet, too. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I mean. Rolling dice is part of the fun. If you wanted a purely deterministic game, we would go play chess, but that's not what I'm here for. Yeah, exactly. All right. We've talked a lot about Mandrakes. We talked about the No Coast Open and your journey through Oklahoma, trying to go to all the other regions to get new players. Have you found any specific city to be like kind of like your satellite city in your area that you want to call out? Yeah, we have... Um... It's like two hours from us, Oklahoma City, and those guys down there, they've got a pretty good group. Um, a couple of them signed up. We have a summer league going on, and two of them are playing in our summer league and driving to Tulsa every week to play uh, just to get their game in. So they're really awesome. They're hosting events. They're sort of coordinating. So when they want to host a tournament, um, they're doing it you know, on off week from us or off months from us. And then uh, Kansas City as well. It's a bit of a further drive, but those guys, they've got a big community and they're all super friendly. So um, the one thing I'd say is we have as a group. So there's some people, some guys over in northwest Arkansas. We've got Oklahoma City and then we have Kansas City and myself. And then we're starting to get some St. Louis people in. But we've got a discord server called Central Control. And it's basically just a bunch of Midwest and um you know, people who we have smaller communities where we're trying to bring them all together to get tournaments and information to each other and sort of bring that central part of the country together to help grow the scene because it seems to, seems to have been lacking for a little bit. So, Yeah, I mean, we'll throw up a link to Central Control on, the, on our show notes. So for anyone who's from that region and wants to catch up with the news from it sounds like the triangle between Kansas City, St. Louis and Oklahoma, you know where to find it in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right, Justin, thanks for coming on and talking about Mandrakes and the No Coast Open. Hopefully it goes well for anyone who does who, you know, is been only half paying attention. No Coast Open, August 17, 18. 18th, yep. Yeah. In Oklahoma. Go meet Justin, go play yeah. some games, and uh, go battle out with the Garrets, right, Justin? Yeah, come out, hang out with the Garrets. Uh, everybody's super friendly out here, and we got a bunch of sponsors on board. So, uh, you know, we'll have a, the website will show us and show all the sponsors, and we'll, you know, we'll have a good time. Sweet. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And thank you, listeners, for listening until the end. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, thanks for coming on, Justin.